is in our dwelling place. A refuge from trouble is near. The Lord is in our dwelling place. Hear the promise of the Lord. Those who love me, I will deliver. When you call me, I will answer. I will rescue you from danger and show you my salvation. Believe this good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. At this time, I invite the children to come forward. something with me today. What is it? Salt. Why do you think I brought salt? What? What? Oh, there's a lot of it, yeah. Well, you know what? Jesus talks in the Bible a lot about salt. He tells us to be the salt to the world. He also tells us in our Sunday school lesson today that what we need to do if our saltiness gets not so salty. What do you think? You know, salt's a pretty neat thing because would you like to eat a hamburger or french fries without any salt? They wouldn't get more broccoli without salt or popcorn without salt. It doesn't taste good, does it? It really makes things taste good. But you know what? It also is used to make sure that the dye in your shirts that are different colors doesn't run. It also is used to make leather. It's also used to make plastic. So what do you think Jesus is talking about when he tells us to be salt to the world? Not sure? What do you think, Ellen?
Stand up for yourself. That's a pretty good one. You know what? I was looking to see if I could find a good book, and I found this in Pastor Martha's bookshelf. It's a book. It says, The Smile That Went Around the World. And I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but it's about a little boy who's on his way to, his, to a birthday party. And he's got a, a big plate of fresh cookies that came his mom would give to him. And as they're driving down the road, he sees a group of people on the side of the road, and they have a sign that say they're hungry. And he looks at his mom and he says, do you think maybe we could give these cookies to those people who are hungry? His mom said, you know what? I think they'll probably have plenty of food at the party. We can give them the cookies to those people on the road. So they go over and give the cookies. And they are so happy to get cookies that they get big smiles on their face. And that put a big smile on the little boy's face. So as he's driving still to go to his party, he finds himself smiling and waving at other people in the cars beside him. And one of the people he meets is Mr. Peabody. And he's in the car next to him, and he's not very happy. Mr. Peabody's a little upset because he's got to go to the airport and has to go to Hong Kong. And he can't be with his family, so he's kind of grouchy. But he sees this little boy smiling at him, and he thinks, wow. And he gets to smiling, too. And then he gets on the airplane, and he notices this other little old lady who's trying to get her suitcase up in the upper bin in the, on the airplane. Overhead bin, very good. I'm glad you got the word for me. <laughs> she's trying to get it up there, but she's a little short like me, and she can't get it there. And so he says, here, let me help you. I'll put it up there. And she, he gets it up there. He gives her a big smile and says, now, if there's anything else you need during this long flight to Hong Kong, you just let me know, and I'll help you out. And that lady, who had felt really alone and sad, traveling all by herself, said, Oh, that made me feel good. And she started smiling. And then she met some people while she was in Hong Kong. And she smiled at them, and they thought, Wow. And they smiled at somebody else. And then somebody else came back into the States, and they were going to a school to see their grandkids doing a play, and they met this little boy. And it was the same boy who gave the cookies originally in our story. And he was looking at them and they smiled so big at him and he thought, wow, maybe what we need to do is to share our love. And an easy way we can love is by smiling. Smiling is a good thing we can always do. Do we always have a smile for somebody? Yes. We can always smile and share our love and our knowledge of how much God loves us. Okay. okay. Even Mr. Peabody, yes. <laughs> Let's all bow our heads and say, Dear God, help us to be salty and to share your love in any way, especially smiles with other people. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Okay, let's go to Sunday school. The first reading is from Hebrews 5, chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the other people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he, also, as he says also in another place, You are a priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with the loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek.
chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it's not so among you. For whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a, a ransom for many. Our hymn is, Lord, Speak to Me, number 463, I invite you to stand.
For as soon as we stepped out of the house to go anywhere, one of them would yell out, Shotgun! Well, our passage today is about two brothers, James and John, calling shotgun on the other twelve disciples. But they're not just trying to get the best seat on a car trip. They want Jesus to save them from the, save them the best seats in heaven. Our passage is another episode on Jesus' final journey to Jerusalem. He knows what awaits him when he gets there. He's going to be arrested and tried and beaten. And then he's going to be killed on the cross and die. And then after those events, the truth about Jesus will be made known. Because he's then going to rise after three days and appear to people who will then understand the message of hope and love and eternal life. And then, after his resurrection, he'll take his place beside God in heaven. That's the messianic secret that Jesus holds and tries gradually to disclose to his disciples. But as we've read in the previous chapters, the disciples continued <clears throat> to miss the point of Jesus' teachings about the reason for this journey. And it becomes ever clearer that Jesus is walking a lonesome valley because the disciples do not comprehend who he is or what he's really about. Even as Jesus heals a blind man who then confesses his belief in him, the disciples seem day by day to grow more blind to Jesus' true identity. And the epitome of this spiritual blindness takes place in the passage for this morning. Two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, come up to Jesus and ask him if he will do them a big favor. And Jesus says to them, what do you want me to do for you? Now let's just pause there for a moment. Can you imagine that? Jesus asking you such a question. What do you want me to do for you? Think of all the gracious possibilities here. The opportunities for healing or forgiveness for clarity about the big issues in one's life. What a precious privilege it would be to be asked that question by Jesus. And so finding themselves then as the focus of his divine attention, this is what they choose to ask. Jesus, would you grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory? In other words, will you save us a place next to you in heaven? These guys could have asked Jesus for anything. They could have <clears throat> asked for lessons on how to be patient with difficult people, or how to truly love their neighbor, or what to hang on to when they feel hopeless or afraid. Any of these big questions that Christians struggle with. But their question was not about how to be more faithful. Rather, with the full attention of Jesus, they chose to ask the most selfish of questions. It was about securing privilege ahead of other people. They wanted to reserve a place of power and prestige next to Jesus at the heavenly banquet. They wanted the front seat in heaven. Jesus, will you let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in glory? And so in response to this question, Jesus says, whoever wishes to be great among you must be a servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a servant of all. What's happening in this story is a collision of two separate paths. The path of self-centeredness and the path of discipleship. You remember that Jesus and his disciples are on the way, which means that they are traveling on the path of discipleship. And on that journey, Jesus was teaching them what loving others look like in the real world. But the question that John and James asked is an intrusion from the other path, the path where the individual, the self, is the most important person. And on the path that James and John were traveling, there were big road signs along the way that read, get as much as you can, or you are always right, or writ large on the biggest one were the words, you are on your own. But in the Christian faith, as people who try to follow Jesus. 
We are called to take the self-centered values of James and John's path and turn them upside down so that the most important person on our journey of faith is the other person, our neighbor. A Christian is never an autonomous individual, and that means that our values are likely going to be the opposite of those of many people. Rather than get as much as you can, we are called to live for the benefit and well-being of other people. Instead of believing that we're always right, we are to accept the fact that chances are we're wrong, and we need to live, and we live in need of forgiveness and grace. And on the third, that big road sign that announces that we are on our own would be replaced with a flashing neon sign that reads, you are never alone. And on the path of discipleship, we therefore live embraced by God's presence and care. And with that assurance, we can reach out to others in meaningful and honest ways. But to be part of the church is to, be, is to make a commitment to be connected to other people, to be part of the community. So what happens then after James and John put their feet in their respective mouths? It's what usually happens in most close communities when something like this happens. Word spreads about what they had done. And in no time, the other ten had found out about it. Think about that dynamic for a minute. I mean, you're in a group working together and then someone in the group tries to cut a deal, tries to get something for themselves. It's a feeling of betrayal for the whole group. And sure enough, it says in verse 41 that when the ten heard what James and John had done, they became angry. Who did James and John think they are? Who did they think we are? That they would betray the sense of community that we have built with one another. So, in another hands-on lesson about leadership, Jesus pulls the twelve together into a room. It's back to the drawing board. And he tells them that they are a community together because of who they are and whom they follow. And he says, you know, out there, to be great means that you're better than others and you lord it over them. But that's not the way it is with us. The mark of greatness is that you are a servant to others. And so whoever wants to be first must be last. And that is Jesus' number one principle of leadership. Whoever wishes to be great must be the servant of all. I want to share a story with you that Archbishop Desmond Tutu tells about one of the many stories that came out of the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa in 1996. Now this process attempted to bring closure to the enormous impact of the atrocities committed under apartheid. And this particular story is a testimony of Jesus' definition of true greatness. A policeman by the name of Vanderbrook was charged with killing the 18-year-old son of a woman and then burning his body while partying with others while he did it. Officer Vanderbrook admitted doing this. He also admitted that some years later he went to the house of the same woman, took her husband, and burned him alive. Now the elderly woman to whom these things happened is present in the courtroom, listening to the detailed accounts of these atrocities that were waged against her family. And as was the custom in these proceedings, the commission wanted to know what she wanted. And so the woman responded calmly that she wished for three things. And in telling this story, Bishop Tutu pauses and remarks that one can only imagine what those three wishes might be under such circumstances. Perhaps she would request revenge through the death penalty. Or maybe she wants $20 million to compensate her for her suffering. She would even be within her rights to ask for a national admission of guilt from all the police forces. That's what usually would happen in these hearings. But that's not what this woman said. First she said, I wish that Officer Vanderbilt would take me to the place where my husband was burned to death so that I can gather up his ashes and give him a decent burial. Second, 
Officer Vandenberg took from me the only family I had, and I still have a lot of love to give. So I wish that he would come to my house twice a month so that I will have someone to love. And thirdly, I wish that Officer Vandenberg could know that God forgives him, and so do I. And in order for him to know that such forgiveness is real, I want to embrace him. And as the court officer led the elderly woman to Vandenberg, he fainted, overwhelmed. Someone began to sing Amazing Grace, and gradually the whole courtroom joined in. Tutu goes on to say that this was the powerful expression of the extravagant love that belongs to one who knows that she is part of a community of faith, a community of which even people like Officer Vanderbrook are members. And when we try to fathom how boundless such love is, or even ask whether we might be capable of making such wishes ourselves, we begin to have some sense of what Christ's mission with all of us truly is. Jesus claims us, sinners though we are, even more boldly and profoundly than did his servant that day in the courtroom in South Africa. And when, as he did with the twelve, he calls us together, and says, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant to all. Well, the life of faith is just such a paradox. As Christians, we are in the position of making choices that are contrary to what our culture would have us choose. And becoming great by serving others is just one of them. So think about it. If Jesus asked you what is it that you want me to do for you? What would you answer? <coughs> it's our joy today to receive uh, new members into membership, and so I invite those folks, if they will come forward now and join us here. And I invite you to turn to page 33, if you will, and join us in the ritual. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We are incorporated into Christ's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the Spirit. All of this is God's gift give offered to us without price. And so to you, Six, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? Amen. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? Amen. And do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in His grace, and promise to serve Him as your Lord? in union with the church which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And according to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representative in the world? And to you, Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ. Will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care?
Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his spirit. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit?
The Lord is indeed our dwelling place, and we move together now into a time of prayer, and as we do, I invite you, if you wish, to come and light a candle that might symbolize your prayer.
as a means of reaching out to a world in need, we give. And I invite the ushers to come and receive this morning's tithes and offerings, please. Sing. Sí. 